Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Professor Manawis. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Dr. Talbot Spivak Holocaust Memorial Committee here at FSW. I'm so uh, happy and excited uh, that you're able to join us today because I'm, uh, I'm very honored that uh, we have uh, a, good, a friend of mine uh, to tell his story today. So all week long, we've had um, uh, stories from Holocaust survivors um, and, and lessons about other genocides. And uh, today you get to, uh, you get a very special treat. We have um, a friend of mine who is uh, uh, zooming in from Cambodia. So it's a little late uh, out there. It's, it's, it's a bit dark for, with his camera, but hopefully you should be able to see him. I'm going to read his bio and then I'll introduce him, okay? Um, Mr. Buntia Keo is a human rights lawyer in Cambodia who advocates for the protection and promotion of human rights in Cambodia. He's currently working as an independent consultant on a wide range of issues, ranging from access to justice for victims of human trafficking to the protection of community forests and protection of the environment. Recently, he has worked as human rights officer for United Nations African Union peacekeeping mission in Darfur under the human rights section to monitor, report, and document allegations of serious human rights violations and violations of international humanitarian law. In the context of ongoing armed conflict in Darfur, prior to that, he has worked as a senior legal advisor to the Cambodian Human Rights Task Force, where he extensively worked in a monitoring and fact-finding fact efforts. He has played a key role in designing many monitoring initiatives. He has also worked with a number of other Cambodian human rights organizations, including the Cambodian Human Rights Action Committee, the Cambodian League for the, for the Promotion and Defense of Human Rights, and international organizations such as the International Labor Organization and Intervita World Alliance. Mr. Uh, I'm going to call him Tia. Tia's work has also taken him outside Cambodia, working for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Nepal, the UN and African Union Mission in Darfur, and Form Asia in Thailand. In addition to his professional background, Tia has experienced being a refugee living near the Thai border during the civil war that erupted in Cambodia from 1979 from 1981. So, furthermore, he had undergone the genocidal regime in Cambodia from 1975 to 1979. Despite having been through the experience of suffering and the great loss of his family members, he survived the brutal regime and transformed himself to be a human rights defender so that he can advocate for the protection of other people's rights, regardless of where, wherever he works. And so I was uh, lucky enough to meet Tia in grad school when we studied together at the UN University for Peace in Costa Rica. And when I, uh, when I heard your story, Tia, I was so um, inspired and honored to meet you. And uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your story with us. Uh, this is being recorded right now. So for our audience uh, watching uh, live, uh, you'll be able to see this recording afterwards. It'll be uh, uh, saved to this link in, in YouTube. And if you have any comments and questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. And we will uh, uh, let Tia know if you have comments and questions throughout his presentation, and he'll be happy to, uh, to answer them. And with that, please begin. And thank you very much, Rob and Steve, uh, for the uh, introduction and for um, inviting me. And to speak uh, about genocide in Cambodia and the um, genocide in Darfur, uh, where I spent a number of years uh, working as a human rights um, officer with the um, United Nations um, African Union uh, hybrid uh, peace operations in Darfur. Um, and during this, um, the Holocaust uh, Memorial Week um, event at the um, Florida, uh, Southwestern uh, College, and thank you, Robson Steve, once again. The um, the topic I'm going to talk uh, in this event um, for the Holocaust uh, Week is about the uh, genocide in Cambodia and also the genocide in Darfur. Um, I think the uh, most of you uh, may um, have known about the genocide in Cambodia through uh, various uh, sources and such as the, uh, you know, uh, movie uh, on the killing field, uh, which was produced by the um, Hollywood, uh, depicting the um, a real story of the victim uh, of genocide in Cambodia. Um, moreover, um, there have been um, a number of uh, publications and books and stuff like that. And, why the genocide in Darfur um, not much um, heard about, um, apart from the um, international media such as the uh, BBC, um, World News, 
as well as the, um, the report of the uh, Human Rights Watch um, after uh, it 25 day uh, missions in Darfur back in 2004 and to um, document all those alleged um, human rights um, violations that took place in Darfur. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about the uh, genocide in Cambodia. And Steve, could you please move to the next slide, please? Um, the, this is the topic I'm going to cover. Um, what happens in Cambodia and Darfur and why it happened and how it happened, where it happened and how do we move uh, on to achieving peace and justice for the victim of genocide? And what lesson have we learned from the past experience? Um, and these are the uh, fundamental questions as well as the uh, topic I'm going to, uh, to speak um, uh, during this event today. Um, before um, going through the topic, I would like to uh, briefly introduce uh, Cambodia to the audience and who may not know where Cambodia is, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have known where Cambodia is um, through traveling and a lot of people may have also been to Cambodia. Um, for those who have not been to Cambodia, maybe know Cambodia through uh, education or through um, uh, reading and so on. Um, the, I'm not going to cover the whole genocide in Cambodia, but I'm going to talk about the uh, personal experience um, as a survivor um, um, through that, the regime and how um, we emerge from that regime and how we move on with our life um, without, um, you know, um, a proper or justice and redress for being a victim of that regime or that brutal regime. Um, please move on to the next slide, Steve. The, uh, this is the picture of Cambodia and Cambodia is, um, you know, quite uh, a beautiful country and, and very rich in terms of uh, culture and history and art. And all those is a small country uh, located uh, in the central part of Southeast Asia between Thailand, uh, Laos and uh, Vietnam. And majority of Cambodia are Buddhism and Cambodia is primarily a flat a country um, with um, a very good um, geographical uh, condition uh, which allow the farmer and to uh, grow rye and throughout the year. And not only that, I think um, with the uh, tropical uh, climate, um, hot and humid and rain, and that allow um, a lot of uh, vegetation to grow and in it is very rich in resource. Um, the, the site of Cambodia is around uh, 100,000, um, uh, 81 and 0 uh, 0.35 uh, kilometers square. And the population uh, was estimated to be uh, 15 million uh, by the recent uh, national census. Um, which is um, which has um, increased uh, more than a double um, in comparison to um, the number in 1975, as you can see uh, in this uh, slide. Um, the uh, please move on Steve, to the next slide. Um, I'm going to talk, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to talk about their personal experience uh, living through the Khmer Rouge. Um, and this is a picture of my brother and I. My brother was three years old um, when the Khmer Rouge uh, took over Cambodia, and I was about one year old. However, um, I don't have the, the photo of my parent, um, but I have the story um, which will be uh, included in uh, this presentation. Um, please move to the next slide. And this is the family photo. Unfortunately, I don't have the old one. And, and the photo was taken a few years ago uh, during the uh, visit of my father to Cambodia. And my mom uh, on the right hand side. And then um, the lady with the red shirt is my um, half sister. And her husband uh, with the blue shirt 
and that's me uh, on the blue shirt as well. And this is the only family photo we have just uh, had uh, recently. Um, we never had the uh, any family photo uh, like that before. And most of the photo were uh, taken by the Khmer Rouge. Um, but there, there is a history to that. Uh, I will talk a little bit more. And can you please move to the next slide? And as I mentioned earlier, the topic will cover what happened and why happened, how it happened, where it happened. And I'm going to start uh, this presentation um, from the um, this um, significant outline um, that led to uh, the rising of the Khmer Rouge uh, power in Cambodia. I would start from the 1970 um, because this year is one of the um, you know uh, a key event and that uh, marked the um, military coup um, to overthrow um, the King of Rom Sien Nuk. Um, he was the, um, uh, he was the um, uh, head of state and after the um, uh, French colonial in Cambodia from um, 1954 up to the uh, 1970. However, I'm not gonna die into the history very much and given the, uh, you know, uh, the time we have. Um, after um, the king was overthrown uh, from the power and the general Lono uh, took over uh, with the support of the uh, United States, because at that time, um, the United States was fighting uh, against the uh, North Vietnam and to protect the uh, it ally uh, South Vietnam and also to prevent the uh, communism from uh, spreading uh, to Cambodia. Um, the regime uh, wasn't really uh, lasted long exactly, um, it's very short, um, because the, um, the king was still uh, very uh, popular among uh, Cambodian population. That's why the new regime did not get support uh, from a majority of the Cambodia, and they're part of the failure of the regime as well. Um, the, the U.S. Uh, government has financially uh, support as well as the uh, logistical call support um, to the regime and to fight again, the, um, to fight along uh, uh, with the, um, uh, this new regime, again, the, um, the uh, communist uh, Vietnam and uh, what it called Yip Kong at the time. And then of course, like the Cheng administration, the U.S. administration, uh, Nixon, I think uh, he was allegedly uh, impeached uh, in 1974. That led to, um, you know, that led to the, um, the stop of the uh, support of the regime. And the regime uh, was collapsed and the Khmer Rouge took over in 1975. Um, when the Khmer Rouge um, came uh, to power, um, it start to uh, implement the, um, you know, um, a new ideology, um, which is a radical uh, communism. Um, in that, in their mind, and they want to um, uh, uh, take the Cambodia from the year zero and to, you know, to an extreme, um, uh, a rural uh, agrarian uh, totalitarianism. Um, with the absolute uh, rejections of the um, free uh, market and capitalism. Um, so this is how it happened. Um, and then they start to uh, empty the city, especially um, the people living in the capital city and have to be uh, evacuated or relocated um, to rural area and to um, work uh, as a manual labor um, in the field uh, to grow rice and also to do other labor work. Um, and that labor work uh, will contribute to the, uh, what we call uh, the um, state uh, run economy. The, my, my family also um, uh, live along the um, other uh, people from Phnom Penh at the time. Um, the first week after the Khmer Rouge took over, um, we left Phnom Penh um, by force and we left our home, we left our property. And my family, um, only four, and my parents and my brother and I, we only four. 
and I was very small. It was very difficult for my parents and to take care of us because um, when the Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia, it was on 17 April. In Cambodia, it was very, very hot. And it's just like how, you know, how hot it is now. And it's very humid. Um, you know, as a small children, it was very, very difficult. Um, without food and without a proper, uh, you know, care. And we were traveling all the way um, um, by, you know, by food. And it's very difficult to parent to carry. Um, yeah, and at one point, um, my father was stopped. And uh, because there were so many checkpoints on the way and why we were um, uh, going toward our final destination and where we um, designated uh, to go by the uh, Khmer Rouge cutter. And we were stopped and then we were served and uh, they found uh, the photo of my father uh, wearing a suit and with a tie. And then they consider him as the uh, intellect and well-educated, whatever they uh, call. And then, um, yeah, and he was taken uh, by the Khmer Rouge cutter and they seized all the photo. Um, they only allow my mom and my brother and I, uh, these small little children, um, to continue the journey uh, to the final destination. And three days later, um, he was released. Yeah, and um, what, what happened to him was that the, um, during the uh, interrogation, um, he told, told them that he, um, he had never been involved in the previous regime or uh, served in the uh, previous uh, administration as the um, you know as uh, as the uh, civil servant or um, have any role in the previous regime, and that's how he was released. And then we continue our journey um, until um, you know um, one uh, district called Phnom Srok, where the Khmer Rouge um, start to build the uh, mega uh, structure, what we call the water reservoir. And because the priority of the Khmer at the time was agriculture, meaning that to grow right in order to export and to China. And in order to, um, to meet the demand of the, um, of the export, right export, and they have to um, create a lot of um, irrigation system and they have to build, they have to build the uh, water reservoir um, to irrigate the right field. Um, to ensure that um, they can, um, you know, grow right uh, throughout the years. And my father was forced um, to work um, uh, with other um, villagers in that village. And during that time, um, there are two um, categories of people. One is the, you know, the newcomer, meaning that um, the people who are not living in that specific locality, but coming from outside of that locality, they call like, uh, yeah, uh, new people and and the uh, the uh, the people living in that local uh, locality they call like the uh, old locality uh, people um, and there there is also a fragmentation you know between the old um, the lo local people and also the uh, uh, the newcomer and 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 oftentimes the uh, local people they report um, you know um, they just make up a story and then a lot of people. Um, got arrested and then um, taken to the uh, execution size and um, one by one and um, and those who um, were working with my father were taken and executed. 1978 and a lot of people were killed and the whole village almost wiped out. And my, my mom started to, um, you know, uh, start to terrify and then um, she had a discussion with my dad that um, and asked my dad to leave uh, because if um, if he um, live at that time and he may have a chance to survive and if he survive he might be able to to help us out and because uh, as for us we cannot uh, go because my mom you know um, have to stick with the uh, two children because we were too small at the time we cannot go anywhere and then my mom um, my mom asked my dad to leave and on that night um, my dad um, um, trying to um, coordinate it with other villagers who have the same you know idea um, to flee um, the village and uh, in order to seek for their new life 
um, they coordinate and somehow the information was leaked down to the uh, Khmer Rouge Carter and around 80 per people were rounded up and killed yeah, instantly on that night. And my mom heard the, in, uh, you know, the news about the execution of more than eight people. And um, he went um, and to ask the people around and those who um, still alive and whether my father is still alive or not. And then no one heard of him. And they told my mom that they did not see him, uh, nor, um, you know, um, see him escape. And the dead body was piling up. And my mom just went there and to look for my dad and uh, she did not uh, find him. So, and then we didn't know what to do. And my mom just, you know, kept praying uh, for his life and he just disappeared uh, ever since. And going back, uh, coming back to um, situation where my mom and I and my brother were living in, at that time, the um, Vietnam started the invasion uh, in Cambodia. And they start from the uh, eastern part of Cambodia and uh, moving toward uh, Phnom Penh on the um, January of um, 1979, uh, Phnom Penh were also uh, taken uh, over by the Vietnam. And then they move um, toward uh, the northern part of Cambodia where um, there, is a, there, there was a Khmer Rouge stronghold and in those area. And also um, geographically very, very difficult to uh, penetrate because the mountain, because the forest and, and the Khmer Rouge, they, um, they have the experience uh, being a guerrilla fighter. It was, was very difficult for the Vietnamese and to push them as well, to push them out. However, um, after a few weeks, the Vietnamese troops um, were succeeded um, to dry the Khmer Rouge out completely. And then we were able to flee that village um, fleeing that village, um, my mom faced another um, situation where she had to make a, a very, very difficult decision because the, uh, the bridge was blasted and, and we had to cross the river and to the other side uh, in order to survive. And with these little um, children, um, my mom had to make a really, really difficult choice. And she cannot carry, of course, like uh, two children at the same time, um, because she was, uh, you know, she was not healthy and due to starvation and lack of food and malnutrition. And she left me on the other side of the river, and she first took my brother across the river and to the other side, and left my brother there, and then she came back and picked me up, and then we all um, can go together. After crossing the river, um, we reached to another village, um, which is not. how my mom was really, really exhausted and she wanted to stay there. But my brother, somehow he was crying a lot and said that um, he, did, he didn't want to stop there. He wanted to move on to the next village. Yeah, and somehow my mom decided to move even though she was exhausted because my brother was crying so much. And for that reason, we left that village. And in that night, the Khmeru came and kill all, you know, the survivor, kill all of them in that village, whoever stay in that village on that night. And we were so lucky and we just left. And that village to the next village was not really far. We could even hear the gunshot, you know, um, the firing um, in the morning. And there were some survivor, uh, very few survivor uh, managed um, to, to move to the next uh, village and to join us. And then um, they told us that uh, a lot of people were killed. It was the last, I think, victim of the Khmer Rouge uh, who were killed in that area. And we managed to uh, leave that uh, village uh, successfully. So now, um, the, when we uh, reach the next village, um, where, where it was the downtown of uh, that region, it called Sisopon. And my mom um, was settled down there and to wait for my father because uh, we didn't see him, we couldn't find him. 
and we couldn't think that you know he died or he's alive whatever um but uh, we were just waiting for him there and we decided not to move to Phnom Penh again so we were living there so I grew up in this town called Sisapon which is um close to Thai border it's around it's around um 40 minute um uh by car, if you go um, to uh, from Sisapon to uh, Poi Pad crossing to uh, mm -hmm. Thailand, it was, yeah, it's around 14 minutes. So we stayed there um, until I finished high school. And it was, um, it was in 90, uh, yeah, 1991. And it was the first time we received um, the letter from the um, International Red Cross. Yeah. And when we opened that letter and um, the letter was a touch with one photo of him and yeah so we found out that he was still alive and he was living in paris yeah at that time we were so happy and to receive the first news from him and the back to um the uh, 1989 uh, at that time, I was about to finish high school, and also the um, the the, um, the Vietnamese uh, troop um, was about to withdraw from Cambodia, and due to uh, diplomatic uh, pressure from international community uh, for the invasion of uh, Cambodia, uh, of course, under the uh, international law, it was uh, completely unlawful, and um, because you um, one country. Um, you know, um, invading uh, another country without um, a security council resolution is not, it's again the, uh, the UN chapter. So Vietnam um, was uh, under the sanction for uh, economic sanction by United States as well as by the, uh, by the United Nations. And due to the pressure, um, Vietnam is, uh, decided to withdraw from Cambodia. Uh, in 1991, uh, and that was the last crew um, to leave Cambodia eventually. And then the Cambodian uh, reached a peace agreement uh, on the same year as well um, with, uh, with the Khmer Rouge. And I'm going to talk back a little bit after the uh, Khmer Rouge, um, you know, uh, regime collapse. And it also uh, started another movement uh, along the border. Um, they got support um, from the United States and from China. Uh, from uh, the ASEAN country, um, you know, Thailand, uh, Singapore, um, Malaysia, and the Philippines, and the, um, yeah, the member of Asian uh, mainly supported the Khmer Rouge and to fight against Vietnam. And Vietnam was also a member of the ASEAN as well. But it was um, due to the, um, you know, due to the Cold War and, and the, uh, the member of ASEAN uh, was um, divided uh, one was under the uh, you know communism and the other one on under the um, um, a liberal democracy uh, under the Western uh, ally and the uh, the Khmer were still um, struggling um, to come back to power but um, there was no opportunity and the Vietnam and they uh, installed a new regime called uh, Cambodian uh, People Party and to be in a power. But one third of the Khmer Rouge uh, were, uh, you know, were in that government and they, um, and they hold um, a key, all the key uh, position. And I felt that the Khmer Rouge hasn't really, um, you know, um, disappear uh, from that uh, regime yet. And that's why the, um, you know the uh, the picture of uh, the genocide and they were gone uh, from most of the Cambodian uh, survivor because the um, because the um, the next regime that was installed by the Vietnam were uh, comprises of the former uh, Khmer Rouge leader as well and then the um, we had the uh, first election. Um, uh, held by the um, United Nations uh, Transitional Authority in Cambodia, uh, what they call UNTAC, yeah, to um, help uh, Cambodia to um, hold the first election. And then um, we got the new government, um, which was very strange. And, you know, uh, there's like uh, two prime minister uh, running the government, and which is a very uh, strange uh, system. 
And however, it was considered and it was recognized by the Western country as the uh, democratic election uh, in Cambodia for the first time. And now, Steve, could you move to the next slide, please? Um, and now we're going to talk about uh, Darfur region, and this is the uh, Cambodian part, and also the uh, my personal story. Um, I will uh, I will pause it, and then we'll start talking about Darfur. And um, and Darfur um, Darfur um, is a region of Sudan. Um, it it located in the western uh, part of Sudan. And the region is 25% um, larger than California, actually, or about the side of France. And therefore, it's home to some uh, 80 tribe uh, and ethnic group and divided between nomad and uh, a sedentary community, uh, what they call the local community, um, the people who never move um, outside of Darfur, like a nomad. Nomad, they move around, yeah. and. Uh, Sometimes they do move to Chad or um, to Nigeria, yeah, and along that, um, you know, along that stretch. Um, can you move to that uh, the next slide, please? So, what happened was that the um, the war um, began in Darfur, uh, in Sudan in um, 1950, I think, uh, before uh, they got independent. Um, Sudan got independent in 1956. But the war started uh, earlier before that, um, you know, the armed conflict uh, between a uh, different group because the uh, Sudan uh, comprises of uh, many tribes. And so the North and the South are always fighting um, because of the, uh, you know, a different um, ideologies or ethnic, um, what it called the ethnic conflict. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to talk much about that. I only talk about that for, um, yeah. So in 2003, uh, what happened was the, uh, in Darfur was the first uh, event that classified as a genocide uh, when the Arab uh, dominated government led by the uh, ousting Obama al Bashir and uh, coordinated, um, you know, with the um, Janjaweed. Janjaweed was the uh, militia that was formed, uh, that was supported um, by the uh, previous government, previous administration, and to um, to uh, to purge again the uh, Darfurian people, Darfurian people known as the uh, you know African uh, descent, and although they share the same religion, Muslim, but uh, ethnically they are not the same. Uh, one considered to be Arab, and the other uh, considered themselves as African. So the conflict over, um, you know, uh, ethnicity and also the identity, and that led to um, this uh, massacre. Um, that was the first time uh, after the, um, you know, after the, uh, uh, after they got independent. Um, genocide in Darfur was a little bit strange because like not many uh, international report, um, you know, it did not see a face on the international uh, news actually, only the uh, BBC new uh, uh, YouTube broadcast one. And then the, um, the uh, Human Rights Board, um, you know, used to um, conduct um, the uh, investigation as well and 25 days in Darfur and to um, to gather information and and eventually um, they um, came up with the uh, 77 page of report mm -hmm. and um, what considered to be genocide in Darfur was that they uh, targeted the um, specific group um, specific um, um, religious group and political and social uh, group um, the three main tribe, one is Masalit and the other one, uh, Zagavar, and the, uh, the other tribe is called Full Tribe. And these are the main tribe, you know, and the other small tribe were the sub tribe. If you uh, are able to destroy these three tribe, and the, you know, the sub tribe will be also uh, weakened, also um, will also be disappeared. Um, so the first, um, report uh, came out from the um, 
uh, State Department was 2004 uh, when the um, and uh, the U.S. diplomat uh, conduct an interview with the uh, refugee who uh, fled from Darfur to Chad, and they conduct uh, about 1,000, I think, the um, uh, interviewee, and all the testimony were very uh, consistent um, regarding the how they were killed and 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 how they were um, tortured and were consistent and very uh, systematic. And what happened was that the, um, the government of, uh, of Sudan, uh, the Khartoum, uh, they, used the, um, they used the air force uh, coordinated with the ground, uh, with the ground force, what they call Janjaweed, and they attacked in the large scale, and that one way, and the other way, and the Janjaweed would, uh, conduct, would rate it uh, you know, uh, how to how, and they um, arrest the man, and they kill the man, and then they rape the women and children. And with the, um, yeah, the report, um, when I first started uh, reading the report of that, well, it was really, really uh, terrible, and also very, very uh, emotional. And the, um, however, um, there has been no uh, decision um, uh, uh, you know, re uh, regarding uh, what to do with the uh, genocide in Darfur. It wasn't uh, until uh, 2007, the uh, Security Council adopt another resolution with the uh, intensive uh, di diplomatic uh, pressure from uh, various, um, you know, uh, foreign country. And eventually the um, Al-Bashir uh, accepted the, um, the, um, the agreement uh, to allow the um, United Nations uh, peacekeeping uh, uh, peace operation um, um, to uh, to come into Darfur, with a condition that the um, the African Union uh, would play a major role, and the United Nations would only su finance uh, support financially and logistically. And um, the um, the hybrid mission was uh, established um, under the uh, Security Council uh, uh, resolution number twenty. 2 and uh, 69 and mandate to um, protect the uh, civilian uh, as well as to uh, strengthen the rule of law and to um, um, to conduct uh, human rights monitoring and reporting um, with regard to the uh, allegation of uh, serious human rights violations uh, in Darfur as well as to um, pave the way and to um, you know a sustainable uh, peace uh, among um, the other group as well. Um, in 2009, and President Omar al-Bashir uh, was, um, was indicted uh, by the ICC and then they uh, led to the uh, expel uh, of the um, more than 10 uh, NGO, um, mainly our humanitarian uh, NGO who were support um, the victim of genocide and to recover. And so they, they were not able to do so. Uh, instead, they were expelled. And because the al um, uh, suspect that and those NGO uh, got money from the West and uh, of course, like the ICC um, uh, was never been accepted by uh, al -Bashir because of the, um, you know, uh, because he considered that in the uh, Western uh, driven uh, tribunal, yeah. And uh, those NGO were kicked out and then um, United Nations uh, peacekeeping and uh, missions in Darfur were able to, uh, to cover uh, humanitarian operation uh, in order to uh, respond to, um, you know, a certain um, uh, social service as well as the um, uh, strengthening of rural law and the uh, build the capacity of the local government and um, to uh, protect the um, uh, internal uh, displaced person uh, from uh, being attacked by both group, the government and also the, um, the rebel group. 2011 and last um, recorded peace talk about Darfur and however, the conflict still, um, you know, still continued until uh, today. Um, yeah, although they have the uh, peace agreement um, with some of the uh, some of the group, but one group led by the Abdul Wahid, they call SLA, um, is still uh, continue to fight. 
uh, please go to the next slide. And we, uh, I'm going to uh, do the comparative analysis um, between uh, Cambodia and uh, conflicts in Sudan. Um, when we talk about the uh, conflict, um, we always look into the, the root cause. What, what, was the, uh, what was the problem? Yeah. So what I think the, um, the root cause of the uh, genocide or the conflict or the civil war, what we call in Cambodia, was the uh, social class. Uh, injustice and also the oppression, and the after the uh, after uh, got independent after Cambodia got independent from France, and there was a lot of uh, social injustice um, among the uh, rural area. They were uh, marginalized. Also, the uh, they were uh, neglected uh, from being able to access to uh, the public service. So. And this uh, social injustice has created a lot of, uh, you know, um, a lot of problem for the people, especially the poor. And, and that's why the uh, communism was very attractive at that time, because communism is about equality, right? It's about justice, you know, it was really, really a good idea, exactly. Um, and that they um, were able to uh, mobilize a lot. And then the Khmer Rouge um, um, uh, came to being in 19, um, actually in 19, uh, uh, 56, and yeah, with the support of the um, uh, of the uh, com uh, Vietnam uh, communists, uh, you know, uh, from the north, the Khmer Rouge um, had grown exponentially um, with the support of the uh, China as well. Um, yeah, and and these were um, the root cause, and then the uh, the Vietnam War and give opportunity um, to the Khmer Rouge and to, um, to empower itself uh, with the support of China again. And the, of course, the, uh, the other aspect was the, um, the uh, emergence of the uh, Khmer Rouge mobilizing grassroots and to fight against the social injustice. And, and through the uh, communist ideology that was really, really popular at the time, especially among, um, you know, young people and who were unemployed at the time uh, who joined this movement. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the influence of communism um, during the Cold War and one of the legacy uh, left behind, you know, by the Cold War and, and due to the um, uh, fragmenta uh, fragmentation of two ideology, uh, communism and liberal uh, democracies. So uh, that was the, uh, the impact of the, uh, of the Khmer Rouge. And look at Darfur and what was the root cause uh, of the uh, genocide in Darfur. It's a little bit different from uh, Cambodia. And the genocide in Cambodia uh, took place a bit, much, much, much later um, than Cambodia. Um, after you know the international community uh, pledged um, not to have um, this kind of event uh, take place again or ever again, and however, you know the conflict um, in Darfur was still um, um, affect uh, still have had an impact on many lives, and what considered to be ethnic conflict um, it's very very difficult to resolve um, if you look at the uh, complexity you know if it was the uh, you know um, social justice or because of economic and um, because of the um, you know the conflict um, over resource it's easy to resolve i think and we can have the shared resources but when it comes to ethnic conflict, um, the conflict over the, uh, the fighting over the identity is very, very difficult. And this is the reason why um, the war is still ongoing in uh, Darfur, um, even until now, until I left Darfur. And the, the, other, the other aspect was the uh, political and economic uh, marginalization of Darfurian. And Darfur, uh, if I were to compare, I don't know, maybe, maybe I think, Cambodia is very uh, considered to be very, very poor already. But if I were compared to Cambodia, Darfur may be like 300 years uh, behind Cambodia. Can you imagine? I will, I will show you the photo on the slide later on. Yeah. Um, the marginalized and the people uh, of Darfur uh, never had access to the, uh, to the, um, the social services. 
and the government never really cares about the people there anyway. Um, and then racism, um, the um, the Arab dominated the government, um, you know, a very uh, racist uh, against the Darfurian people. That was the uh, cause of the conflict. A merchant of arms struggle um, to have a power uh, balance yeah, with the government. And the, of course, whenever there is racism, there is like, um, you know, um, um, political and economic uh, marginalization, they are always um, struggle and to balance uh, with the government. And the um, establishment of the uh, of the uh, SLA as well as the um, justice and uh, equality um, a movement we call GEM. And it's a coalition uh, to fight um, against the al Bashir regime. Yeah and to have the uh, power balance. So, and these are the, um, the root cause uh, of the um, genocide in Cambodia and Darfur. I move to the next slide, please, Steve. And this is the photo of genocide in Darfur. Um, and actually, um, the photo uh, was taken by me, it was back in 2009, when I first arrived in Darfur. And I was assigned to, uh, to lead um, a humanitarian uh, you know, assessment team uh, to this village um, in order to um, get the um, uh, situation report and on what we need to respond. And so I went to uh, conduct an assessment uh, in this village and had just been wiped out by the Janjaweed. And you see the Janjaweed uh, riding uh, on the back of the horse, like um, and this photo I show. And the photo were taken from far away. Yeah. And they were still, uh, some of them were still loitering around the village and it's just make sure that no one alive. Yeah. And then the, um, when we arrived and they had just left, yeah, in this village. And then we were looking for uh, where these people um, gone to, and some of them still survive, and then they uh, went to hide uh, behind a mountain somewhere and in the area, which is very close. Oh no, um, the photo was taken really, really far away, yeah, and from the car, exactly. And yeah, we did not, um, yeah, they did not see us, yeah, they did not see us, yeah. Uh, we could have been in trouble um, if they saw us, yeah. Okay, um, Steve, could you please move on to the next slide? And this is the uh, photo of genocide in Cambodia. And yeah, and uh, this year, these are the, uh, the prisoner um, whom were considered to be the enemy of the organization uh, or the, uh, someone against the, um, the regime, yeah. And so basically what they did was that they, um, they identify and them through uh, someone wearing glass, you know, uh, someone look very, um, you know, look very fair skin and I don't know. And then they just like uh, take them and bring them to um, the interrogation room uh, in, the, um, in this prison. By the way, um, this prison, it was former um, high school and then it, 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 it was turned to um, you know, to a detention center, uh, what we call S21. Yeah, S21 is known and to all the uh, Khmer Rouge cutter are known to all uh, Cambodian people. And this um, uh, detention center only, um, you know, um, um, conduct the only uh, youth to carry out the uh, interrogation. Yeah. And then a lot of torture and some were tortured to death even like in 1979, uh, the dead body is still lying on the on the floor and in bed. Yeah, when the uh, Vietnamese um, took over uh, Phnom Penh. However, uh, I did not uh, show that photo because I think uh, it very it would be very very emotional and it would be uh, it's not really appropriate to. Uh, please move on to the next slide. Too. Um, yeah, the uh, peace agreements in Cambodia and the. Um, we had the Paris Peace Agreement Accord, which I already mentioned in '90, that paved the way to the uh, democratic election uh, in Cambodia, and that was organized by um, United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia called UNTAX. And then 
yeah, after the national election and then the formation of the new elected government, and then of course, like um, 2003, and you know, the United Nations appoint the Cambodian government for the uh, possibility um, to establish the uh, the tribunal, and the and then they had reached an agreement uh, to form the uh, hybrid uh, tribunal, and 50 percent, uh, you know, led by Cambodia. And another fifty percent led by the um, led by the uh, international community, um, United Nations, and and then um, in order to try and um, those uh, aging uh, community leader and who were uh, believed to be responsible uh, for the um, for the regime, and so far I think it's only um, yeah uh, some of them have already uh, died, have already passed away, and. Um, uh, two or three of them has been, um, yeah, has been uh, uh, prosecuted, yeah. And then, you, uh, and then look at therefore, and a UN intervention through the uh, Secure Council resolution uh, came. Uh, the first one was like um, uh, Security Council uh, resolution number um, seventeen and sixty nine. And, and that um, the formation of uh, UNAMID uh, in Darfur in 2007. As I mentioned earlier, it wasn't until 2007, and you know, and the UN came and to um, to provide the, uh, the protection to the civilian of Darfur. And in 2010, and Sudan was split into uh, two countries, and probably most of you are aware of. And this is one of the uh, world, uh, you know, um, uh, history as well. And so, Sudan, uh, South Sudan, uh, is the uh, the you know, youngest countries in the world. And through referendum, at that time, uh, I was there and to help the uh, organize the uh, consultation with the uh, South Sudan uh, leader as well as the um, at, as well as the um, you know uh, some um, Darfur. Darfurian tribe and who um, who were majority are uh, Christian and who also want to um, to join uh, to move to uh, South Sudan. We had uh, conduct a lot of the uh, consultation uh, workshop, yeah, um, for them. And then um, the UN uh, continue its presence um, in the area of peacekeeping and peace building, and this is the uh, the um, the key mandate um, to. Um, to keep the people of that who are safe. And however, um, the conflict still ongoing, as I also uh, mentioned earlier, that although the presence of the United Nations there, but the fighting was still, and then the people uh, remain um, suffer, uh, especially for, for the uh, internal uh, displaced person. And uh, one, uh, one in a while, you know, the, um, the gender with, um, they attack them, and yeah, they raid the house, and then they um, th they rob the property, and then they rob the women, and they kidnap the uh, children, and and so on. Was still ongoing uh, when I was there, and uh, we did a lot of um, documentations uh, uh, with regard uh, to the allegation of the um, um, you know kidnapping as well as the. Um, uh, STVB and the uh, gender-based uh, sexual violence, um, and that led to the um, and that led to the um, led to the uh, indictment of the Al Bashir, because the um, rape is also categorized as the uh, crime against humanity under the uh, Rome Statute. Yeah, and various peace agreements uh, were signed, but they all were failed, and they never reached, um, you know, and, and they never committed to it. Even until now, I think only uh, some group still, um, uh, yeah, were able to um, to sign the peace agreement, but some group still not, even though the government, the regime has already uh, been changed. And it's very sad for Darfur and people. Um, please move to the next slide, Steve. And this also the, the, the picture of gender with the photo uh, was taken by the um, uh, Asian press, I think the, uh, the French uh, yeah, uh, media. Yeah, I took from their websites and 
and it wasn't really clear actually um, I think it made for that purpose yeah. Uh, move to the next slide. Yeah, um, uh, talking about the Chanjavid, um, the um, I already mentioned the Chanjavid. Uh, they destroy um, the village and kill men and boy and rape women, and you know, and they raise crop and destroy water well. And that was, um, you know, that was built by NGO as well as some of them built by the uh, by the UN agency, and then they use violence, you know, as a tool and to um, intimidate the uh, Dafurian uh, people and they, um, you know, um, they fight um, assault, uh, indiscriminately uh, on the civilian uh, in a large scale. Um, and I remember that in one, uh, in one attack, more than, more than 100 people die, um, including women and children. Yeah, we documented. Um, it was really, really uh, heartbreaking. Yeah, incident. Every time when we heard about this, and I was praying that please, uh, yeah. And move to the next slide, still. Yeah, and seeking for justice, and we're talking about and how we move on toward uh, peace and justice. Well, Cambodia Khmer Rouge Tribunal was established in June 2003 and, you know, known as the hybrid um, tribunal UN uh, combined with the Cambodian uh, expert. But um, the impact of the, you know, the outcome of the uh, tribunal was very, very uh, little. I think it's not really uh, satisfy uh, Cambodian, although um, and those uh, most responsible have already been tried. Um, stand trial or they have already uh, prosecuted but uh, what it can you know bring back for um, the victim and that that remain a question you know to be asked um, the Cambodians actually um, is very very uh, resilient um, you know people and um, they somehow managed to um, to move on their life uh, with uh, many aspects um, and religion also play a very, uh, Buddhism play a very, very uh, key role and to help them uh, moving on their life and most of them. And because we believe in, um, you know, in karma and what you did um, in this life and you will pay off in the next life, I think that really helped people a lot to move on. And that in terms of seeking for justice um, for Cambodia and then uh, for Darfur, um, the uh, government have put an effort um, to establish a special, um, you know, criminal court for Darfur or a special court for Darfur crime. Um, was domestically established in um, 7 June 2005, and after the, um, after you know, after the um, the massacre or after the genocide. And, and, and the government uh, want to cover it and that even by uh, establishing uh, this uh, tribunal and, you know, and uh, the objective was to cover uh, what they did in Darfur. And then they also established another um, truth and reconciliation. And, and these are these two uh, institutions are led by the, uh, by the government and has never been independent, uh, has never been neutral. Um, in many ways, and it heavily influenced by the government, so they are not credible. And however, um, as a UN, a United Nations need to work with them and to strengthen their capacity and and to build their capacity to be able to um, to work uh, independently uh, from the uh, influence of the government. Um, yeah, we did um, send them to a uh, foreign country, uh, for instance, like judges, prosecutor. Um, we send them to uh, to Uganda, send them to Kenya to get uh, a proper training and how to handle, um, you know, um, the uh, the crime in Darfur. Although some cases has been um, sent to uh, to ICC and to Rome, but I think the uh, some cases uh, they need to uh, handle uh, domestically. Yeah, and especially um, those um, are less responsible for, uh, you know, uh, they're not um, they're not in the position of uh, you know leadership, and they need to be tried locally and domestically. And please move on to the next slide, Steve. 
and and look at the um, traditional uh, justice mechanism um, as I mentioned earlier and this have had a Cambodian uh, many Cambodian uh, to move on uh, their life and Buddhism um, play a role in healing uh, individual community and society as a whole um, as myself and my family and uh, we very much uh, strongly uh, believe in this and and we never uh, believe in the uh, you know in the um, form of justice especially and the tribunal whatever that was established by united nations jointly with the cambodian government yeah we never believe it because they spend so much time um, and so much um, uh, money and with a very little result and no form of truth and reconciliation was established but i mean people and put their own effort and to move on and that what happened in cambodia and uh and therefore as i mentioned earlier truth and reconciliation commission and therefore crown uh, were already established but both were not functional at all and you know it just um, the establishment just for the formality and to show um, or to appease the international community um, that okay and we have this um, you know uh, we have this um, mechanism to address what had happened in Darfur but it actually never functions yeah it never worked yeah and and Darfurian peoples remain uh, suffering uh, from the ongoing armed um, conflict. So, and this is the, real, the realities in, in Darfur. Um, moving on to the next slide. And lesson learned. Um, uh, what we have learned uh, from these two genocide is that the education um, is the most powerful uh, weapon, I think, to um, educating uh, your new generation, uh, your children and yourself. Um, and be an active citizen um, to get involved in politics. Get involved in politics, it doesn't have to be politician, um, but to follow and to to hold the um, you know, politician accountable. And many Cambodian whom I talked to, um, you know, they were um, so busy, you know, uh, before the Khmer Rouge regime, they never think about the politics. They never, you know, um, they never care who the leader was at that time. And they never um, criticized them. And they were so peaceful. Cambodian people, very peaceful yeah, people. And they never challenged um, you know, them, the politician. And the other point is that don't place your faith in the hand of your leader at all. And you know, even those, um, your leader is brilliant, but I think um, uh, as a human being, you know, we make a mistake and that mistake only the people, um, you know, um, who under the, that uh, leadership uh, can actually, um, you know, can actually see, because like a single person and cannot, um, you know, um, doesn't know um, what kind of mistake he make, and but a million people probably have a, you know, um, a different perspective. They can actually um, tell um, the leader or, or uh, what you did was wrong. Yeah, and questions about the policy and decision of your government, um, you know, why they're going to war. And that's very, very important uh, questions. Uh, yeah, but in case of Cambodia, we never challenge that, um, the government decision. So we leave our faith in the hand of uh, the government. Whatever the government do, it's really up to them, even though they're corrupt, even though they, um, they're not uh, functional properly although they never, um, you know, adopt any policy and to serve the people as they're supposed to be. And we never question them. We just let them, uh, you know, do whatever they want. And this is, uh, this is the reason why that uh, genocide took place in Cambodia. And it is the same in Darfur. I think the scenario, if I um, view it uh, uh, thoroughly, Um, yes, I um, I live without my father uh, for most part of my life. Um, I only uh, met him the first time in 2002, um, quite recently, actually. Um, 
And uh, and going back to um, your questions, um, my dad and reached the border. You know, after more than eighty people were um, were executed, and we uh, he managed to uh, to reach a Thai border uh, with along with other eight um, survivor. But arriving at the border and the uh, you know the Thai bodyguard, they open uh, fire as this indiscriminately as well and since some of them die so maybe eventually four or five of them uh, still survive and because the UNHCR and the Red Cross they were working along the border they came to receive them because my dad he was educated man and he was able to understand the uh, you know um, the law of war and the international uh, humanitarian law and what he did was the amazingly uh, he raised his uh, t-shirt you know white t-shirt he waved his t-shirt and then the Thai bodyguard, they understand, oh, uh, he surrendered something. So he's just a victim and he, he was unarmed. So they stopped the firing. And then the UNHCR and then the, uh, the Red Cross, the International Red Cross, they came and took him. But um, the, um, you know, since Thailand um, is not the state party to the uh, International Convention on the Protection of Refugees, and crossing the border to Thailand um, for a political reason is also considered to be unlawful. And that's why my, my father was uh, prosecuted under the immigration law of Thailand. So he had to go through the, um, you know, um, to the, uh, the legal process. Um, eventually the UNHCR uh, bailed him out uh, from the uh, detention uh, in Thailand. And then uh, he was offered a job to work with the UNHCR um, until until uh, 1981. Um, while he was staying in Thailand, uh, he was hoping to uh, to see us, you know, and at the refugee camp. So he went uh, to the refugee camp uh, along the border and to look for us, but uh, he couldn't find us. And we actually we went to. Um, to the Thai border as well, to a refugee camp. It was uh, after the Khmer, after the Khmer Rouge collapse, and we went there along the way. I did not talk about this because a, a lot of dead body um, and the blood stain and smell. I was at the time it was around three and a half years old, but I couldn't eat. You know, like I couldn't eat at all the whole day. Um, I was vomiting as a, you know, as a. As, as a baby and my mom was so much worried about me and it was like constantly vomiting and the smell of the cop, smell of the dead body. And uh, because, you know, summertime, it was like everything was decay. It was so smelly, a lot of flies and even as small children uh, like me, I could actually relate to that. Um, yeah. So we went to refugee camp um, in Thailand and we took the risk, my mom, you know, as a widow with the two, um, a single mother with two children. And we did not find him. And at that time, um, there were, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the armed movement led by the Khmer Rouge uh, factions and to overthrow Vietnam. And there were um, other three factions uh, also joining and to fight. And, and most of the time, you know, the war uh, between them and led to, um, um, you know, a serious human rights violation, and also led to um, killing a lot of uh, civilian, a lot of civilian casualty. So my mom could not bear with um, that situation. We returned uh, back to Cambodia um, uh, in 1980. Um, coming back, and we had to face, you know, with the uh, a lot of challenges because the a lot of um, uh, checkpoint established by Vietnamese as well as the uh, you know the communist regime, and so a lot of um, a lot of women uh, were raped. And my mom she took that risk you know to come uh, back to Cambodia, but uh, somehow you know, um, yeah, we were blessed and we were safe and to return to Cambodia and also continue uh, looking for my father in Cambodia and even in front him. So until. 91, we received his letter. Um, yeah, I was living with the, my father uh, for most part of my life. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Rob. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, this is the lesson learned um, that I think that we all uh, should 
um, yeah, so really um, look into um, the past experience. Um, any other questions? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Tia. Uh, we have another comment um, from Saim Mies. It's great to hear from you. I learned a lot from your experience and your presentation. It is very inspired. I will follow the lesson from, from you for sharing. Thank you so much, Tia. Okay. There are a couple other questions from uh, comments from Gabrielle. Uh, it's a bit unbelievable to think that this kind of injustice is still happening today. You are around, you are around my age and I remember hearing stories in high school, uh, but with no details. She says, real connection to reality at that time. There was no real connection to reality at that time. Now my daughter and I are listening to this and we're awestruck. Thank you so much for sharing that. We, we are a bit over time. Do you have a few more minutes to, to wrap up, Tia? Yeah. Okay, yeah. uh, I guess a quick question would be, what inspired you to join the UN peacekeeping mission in Darfur? Well, um, first of all, um, I, uh, you know, I grew up in, you know, very hostile environment and very uh, violent environment, uh, you know, throughout my childhood. And the effect of the, uh, you know, violent and made me become a very strong um, and, um, you know, give me a different perspective. And also, um, you know, I had the um, a commitment um, to work for uh, the humanity since I was a child and coming back, you know, from the refugee camp to Cambodia. And we, we come across a lot of, um, you know, lies and death. And if we were caught by the Vietnamese and we were killed anyway, um, if we were caught by the Khmer Rouge, uh, we were, uh, we, yeah, we, we will also get killed. So, so from, from that time, I swear to myself, you know, if I were, uh, you know, so why and this uh, time, I will do ever um, I could, you know, um, to be part of the uh, humanity. So that's why I study, um, I study law and I study uh, human rights. And I joined the peacekeeping uh, mission through uh, BBC exactly, um, you know, the first broadcast was 2000, um, uh, 2004, and about that for, um, and then I, you know, I looked up um, the information, I followed up very closely and how to get there. And I saw some of the job advertisement at that time, then I applied and then I got selected. Yeah. And it was really, really, um, you know, inspiring. And then I was able to um, influence some of the uh, my colleagues as well, you know, and through sharing my uh, story and my experience living through um, the genocide in Cambodia, and it really helped them and um, to live through, um, you know, um, the horrible time uh, in their country as well. Yeah, to move on with their life, and that was really um, one of my, uh, you know, achievement. I think the uh, through the personal connection and story sharing. Of course, like um, the work that I did in Darfur has contributed to, you know, a bigger picture of the uh, peacekeeping mission for the United Nations uh, to um, uh, effectively implement its mandate. But at the personal level, I also make some, you know, impact on uh, people, other people alive as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you. Um, Marie Sender says, thank you for sharing your experiences. It, it is really inspiring. Uh, Paola, <laughs> Paola Sanchez. Uh, Paola says, thank you, uh, Tia, for this presentation. You keep inspiring me. Keep on with the great job you are doing as, as a human rights defender. The world needs more Tias. Oh, I'm going to tear up. Um, thank you, Paola. Um, Tia, I share, I share the same sentiments. Um, Gabrielle agrees. And um, we are very honored and lucky uh, to, the, to hear you tell your story, especially that uh, how you taught us um, um, how you survived that, that the Cambodian genocide to help uh, uh, and the other genocide in, in Darfur. I think it's important that you, you pointed out that um, uh, there was no official uh, peace and, re and reconciliation um, in Cambodia. So that it, it, it seems like the people on their own have to uh, as you said, move on and, and try to come to terms with. They have happened. to find their own way yeah, to move on, yeah, with and, their and own I, life. 
as a human right as as a human rights lawyer, I think that's why it's so important to have people like you there who, who can who can contribute to that uh, uh, towards justice. And um, I think a lot of a lot of people uh, were were interested to know we don't have experience of, of being on the ground in Darfur, and there was no official end to that genocide. And even though uh, President Omar al Bashir is no longer in power, you see that the the violence still continues. The the the, the people in Darfur are still suffering, so it's important. And thank you for sharing, uh, uh, shining the light on that still, that we should still um, pay attention to what's going on there. Um, and it was really very powerful and inspirational that uh, the story that you mentioned with your family, um, that's, that's amazing that you were able to, to reunite after such time and, and that you and your family were able to survive. Um, is there, do you have any other messages for our students or, or anyone else in the audience uh, to leave them with? Well, I think the my message is that the uh, peer education is very, very uh, powerful, um, you know, um, education and to um, teach our next generation and to um, Yeah, and how to live in peace. I don't know how to um, articulate it. Um, yeah, it's just uh, Yeah, that's my message. Uh, I think the um, Peace is very, very important for each and everyone, and not just the term, um, but peace in action, meaning that uh, everyone has to contribute to it. Yeah, It's not just a term. If you only uh, look at uh, the term of peace and just from the word, it will never happen. I think the, um, the genocide will repeat it. But you look at it from your actions and how you contributed as a person, as a humanity, and to make that happen, I think it's very important from the individual level and then community level and then society and then of course the world. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Somali Kum says it is a very, inter is a very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for educating us uh, about all, all of these things. And thank you for being a living example uh, of peace uh, for us all. Um, everyone, I'm po posting the link for our other events. You can, if you miss some of this uh, uh, amazing presentation, you can go back to uh, this link on YouTube and it'll, it'll be, uh, the recording will be here for you to view. And here is a link to our other events. We have another event in about 12 minutes. Um, one of our professors will be uh, uh, teaching us about the, the, the genocide in Guatemala. And then we have a Holocaust survivor speaking uh, in the evening. So thank you again so much, Tia. It means so much to me. Uh, that you uh, were able to tell, to tell your story tonight. And um, uh, we're very lucky and honored. Thank you so much. And, and thank you very much, Rob. Thank you for, still for the opportunity. And yeah, and I'm very uh, honored uh, to be able to talk and to tell the story of Cambodia. And, and uh, therefore, thank you very much. Yeah. And Tia, if you could stick around for a moment after we end the stream, we can chat and say bye, OK? Yeah, please, please, please. Okay. Uh, yes, Thanks, everyone. Certainly. Thank you very much, Rob. Yeah. Hey, Steve, can we cut the live stream?